Welcome back as we continue our coverage of the parliamentary debates on Parliament's budget vote. At the time when Mr. Sisulu was presenting Parliament's budget to the National Assembly, his colleague in the NCOP, Mr. Mnino Matlangu, also addressed members of the Council on the 2012-2013 budget. Mr. Matlangu said the budget of 1.763 billion rand included 430 million for members' remuneration. The objectives for, of, for the new financial year also included building an effective and efficient institution to increase oversight over the executive and to increase public participation. Building an effective and efficient institution, strengthening oversight, increase public involvement and participation, improve and widen international cooperation and participation. These do not answer all the issues that members raised during the last budget vote but they do answer most of them. Like Mr. Sisulu, Mr. Matlangu also briefed members of the NCOP on developments with regard to the Secretary to Parliament and the Chief Financial Officer, who had both been put on special leave. As members are aware, the Secretary and the Chief Financial Officer were placed on leave to allow the investigation by the Auditor General into the salary advance payment to the Secretary to Parliament with regard to the construction of a perimeter wall at uh, his residence. The report was tabled at a special meeting of the Parliamentary Oversight Authority. The POA considered and accepted the report and the recommendation by the Auditor General. In this regard, Parliament will formally engage with Mr. Dingani and Mr. Uh, Mr. Mondo, Leslie Mondo, the Chief Financial Officer, regarding these processes to follow. Both Mr. Zing Dingani and Mr. Mondo have been on special leave since March 26. The Deputy Secretary, Mr. Mike Kudzier, has been acting as a Secretary. We'll have more on the subsequent NCOP debate at a later stage. But for now, we go back to the debate in the National Assembly. Mr. Vincent Smith of the African National Congress said Parliament should be a people's parliament, but the majority had no access to Parliament. They could also not afford to watch the parliamentary channel on DSTV. He urged Parliament to look into this matter. The current arrangement of the parliamentary television channel being flighted on pay TV marginalizes the majority of South Africans who cannot afford to pay for the service and thereby are excluded from participating <clears throat> or being empowered in the work of Parliament. On the other hand, Deputy Speaker, one of the key performance areas of the national broadcaster is that of education and information dissemination. It should therefore be in the interest of the SABC to flight committee and other parliamentary business on a dedicated channel that has the potential of reaching a larger audience at a much cheaper, a much reduced cost to the viewers. This is an option that must be considered seriously by this House. Mr. Smith also had a problem with the manner in which Parliament's budget was allocated. He said the National Treasury and the Executive determined Parliament's budget, but those were the very institutions that Parliament was supposed to oversee. This determination of the extent of Parliament's operations through controlling the purse strings encroaches on the doctrine of the separation of powers as envisaged in our Constitution. Deputy Speaker, the research capacity and other support that Parliament generally and the Portfolio Committee specifically have access to is nowhere near that that is at the disposal of government departments. It is highly unlikely that any effective oversight can be done without drastically strengthening the support of the Committees of Parliament and for individual members of Parliament. In many of the committees, <coughs> research capacity and other support structures is sorely lacking and sometimes non-existent. And, the very, and very often the reasons advanced for this state of affairs is a lack of adequate funding. If adequate funding of Parliament is the issue, 
then this further strengthens the argument for a need to revisit the funding model of Parliament that gives the responsibility of deciding the budget of Parliament to the very executive that is subject to the oversight of Parliament. <clears throat> a revised model of funding must recognize that the amount allocated to this institution to carry out its work must be equitable to its responsibility in entrenching a democratic order in South Africa. The chief whip of the Democratic Alliance was equally critical of the resources allocated to Parliament. He was also concerned that not enough debates were initiated on critical issues. Parliament should be the center of debate in the country because that is what truly makes it a people's parliament. But sadly, very sadly, the bitter truth is that during 2011, this parliamentary procedure was used on only four occasions in the entire year. Only 14 of the political parties elected to parliament were able to debate a subject for discussion that they had proposed. Isn't that an utter disgrace? Yes. But ample time was made available for members to give one-way, two-minute sound bites and lectures. We had countless notices of motion being read aloud and no less than 229 motions without notice were given the precious time of the House. On top of this, innumerable, me innumerable member statements were regularly addressed to the executive in this chamber. At the last, their total disregard for Parliament, for Parliament is regularly displayed by the utterly poor attendance of ministers who in terms of our rules should be present to reply to those statements. At last week's session, the ongoing pattern was yet again confirmed when sadly only one minister and five deputies were present in the House for responses to statements. This is not a people's parliament at all. Mr. Watson was also highly critical of the way questions were treated in the House. He said ministers had no choice but to reply to those questions. This mechanism is also not working. As of Friday the 11th of May, no less than 505 questions remain unanswered. Only six of those unanswered questions were put by the members of the governing party. We, in opposition, with the greatest role to play in holding the government to account, are waiting for answers to the remaining 496 questions. And just so you know, Honorable Speaker and Deputy Speaker, nearly 400 of those were put by the Democratic Alliance. As I recently wrote to the Speaker, being able to ask regular questions to a minister is Parliament's right. Answering them is not a choice. It is the minister's constitutional duty and obligation. I acknowledge your efforts and the undertakings thus far, Honourable Speaker, but I regret I will not stop, you will not stop hearing from me until this matter is properly improved. We hear what other members of the National Assembly had to say about Parliament's budget and the way it operates after the break. Stay with us.